hopefully I can tell you guys about something that I think is really cool, uh, which is promises. So promises uh, are a solution to the asynchronous code callback issue, right? So let's talk about callbacks for a minute. Because we, we, know and we know them and we don't quite love them. And we're all looking for solutions, whether they be Winge.js or Lua or perhaps Promises. So this is my favorite solution. Um, whether you like it as much as I do is up to you at the end of the talk. So callbacks suck because doing things in sequence is hard, one after another. And doing things in parallel you know, is harder. And then finally, errors get lost really easily. So. Uh, Let's just take a quick look at these problems. So if you're trying to do things in sequence, like say you're looking for a button click and then prompt the user for their Twitter and then get their tweets and then show those tweets in the UI, you have to write ugly nested code like this that I'm sure we've all seen. Um, and then doing things in parallel, of course, is even worse because if you wanted to get the tweets and their Stack Overflow answers and their Foursquare check-ins, I don't know if you guys use Stack Overflow. Do you guys use Stack Overflow? Yeah. yeah? Good, excellent. Stack Overflow is wonderful. Wanted to make sure that wasn't getting lost. So if you wanted to do all these things at once and, and only fire the callback when they were all done, you'd have to write code like this, right, with this magical something finished function, which is, which is just a great function. I, I'm being sarcastic here. This, this function sucks. Writing functions like this sucks, and, and nobody wants to write functions like this all the time. Um, so finally, right, there's, there's the errors get lost easily problem. So this is just some, some code. That, that doesn't have any error handling. But unfortunately, most of our code looks like this, right? We were like, oh, well, there was an error. Well, maybe I'll just ignore it. Oh, well, any of these FS read files could have failed, but I'll just kind of hope that doesn't happen, right? And so there's nothing enforcing us having to deal with these errors. And even if we try and deal with them, we can start, dealing, we can start getting into issues like we saw in the, the pitfalls talk where you call your callback twice, and really, it just, it's no fun. Um, so, so that's, that sucks. Um, so you could write your own library to make this nicer. Um, and, and in fact, many people have. So if you go to the, the Node.js wiki, right? So this, this is just a list, a list of all the modules people have written under async flow, which is kind of their way of saying how to handle this problem. And this only goes up to F, um, which is not very far down the alphabet. So there's a lot more modules, and this was like, like a year ago, maybe. So there's even more now. So obviously, a lot of people are solving this problem in different ways. So which is the best solution, right? How are you going to deal with this? Um, well, so in my opinion, the best ways to solve this, this callback suck problem is based on something called promises, all right? So let's talk about those for a minute. The basic idea is that instead of p calling a past callback, right, where you pass in a function to another function, that, that, that function that you want to get the results of, it returns a promise. And a promise is something that represents an eventual value. So it's not something yet, right? Because that, that file, you're still reading it from the disk. You don't know what it's going to be yet. Or it might have erred. But eventually, it will be either a success or a failure. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So if we were trying to do like a very simple addition thing with a callback, you know, it would look like this. Um, but if we were trying to do it with a promise, here's how it would look. We'd, we'd have a function that actually returns a value. This is kind of nice because it looks kind of like synchronous code where we get to return things and we get to actually use that whole part of our language with return values. Um, and then we do this thing called then. This is the key to promises is the dot then method. Um, so you say promise dot then when the result comes back, you, get, you check the result. So, so that looks like kind of basic, right? Like this, you know, okay, I just moved some code around. This is not that different, these two examples. But in, in actuality, what this enables is a lot of really powerful patterns. And so let's go over the advantages of what you can get by using promises for your async solution. So just, just kind of, I'm going to go through each of these, right? So cleaner method signatures and uniform, like, return or error semantics. So this is jQuery's get method. It doesn't have an error handler. So if you get an error, you're just going to lose it. The success handler takes three arguments. It has all these optional arguments. The last argument isn't a callback. It's actually the second to last argument, but it's optional, so it could end up in the second position or the third position. This is kind of a nightmare. Um, so you really have no idea like, how you're supposed to use this method. And it's worse, because then you go to the dollar sign dot Ajax method, and that's supposed to be like in the same category, but in fact it behaves completely differently. 
you, you have to pass in this settings object, which has you know, three possibilities, success, error, or complete. And each of them takes a different number of arguments. So, so I mean, I, I don't think anybody likes using the jQuery AJAX API. Um, it's, it's nice and convenient because XML HTTP request is even worse, but nobody likes doing this. Um, and then you, you go to node and you have this kind of thing, right? And this is almost sane, right? We've got an optional argument that kind of confuses things. Um, but it's, at least we have this, this standard pattern that it's the last argument and it always takes an error as the first parameter and the result is the next. Except for sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes they pass you two arguments. They pass you an error and then like two things like written and buffer. So you never know. It's not like synchronous code where you know you get only one return value and you can only deal with one thing at a time, either one error or one return value, never both. Um, right, so here's how it would work with a promise, right? You would pass in your data just like you would with a normal function. And it might be optional parameters or whatever. But the important thing is that all your data comes back in, in one of two forms. Either the promise is fulfilled, so it's success, and then you only get one variable back, right? Just like you get one return value in synchronous code. Or it's rejected, which is like throwing an exception. So you get one error back, and it's going to be an error object, just like a thrown exception. So that's, that's really nice, like, okay, now we have something that's kind of the same every time. There's always either one return value, one fulfillment value, or one rejection reason. So that's cool. But it's really a lot more than just like making your code a bit easier to read. You get nice things like uh, composition. So, so this is a basic example of a function that you know, uses jQuery Ajax to get the user. But let's say we wanted to compose this, right? So we have to pass through the success and error callbacks to the Ajax function. And that's a lot of work, right? You have to do that every time. You have to remember, don't forget your error callback. Well, if you were doing it with a promise, you could just do this. You could say, I'm going to get this promise. And all you do is call this other method that returns a promise. So since we're using return values in this way, we can use function composition like we were able to do in synchronous code, even with async constructs. Um, this gets even more powerful, right? So let's say we needed to do something to transform our data before we returned it, or before we called back our callback in the, in the callback case. So we get, the, we get the data, like the user, but we want to get their first name. So what you have to do is you have to create this like success proxy function. And this takes the data, pulls out the first name, calls the callback with it, and of course you just pass the error argument right through. Well, with a promise, it's even nicer. You can just say, you get a promise, and then you call this get method that picks a property off the promise, the first name property, and you get a promise for the first name property. So promises are composable in this sense that you can take promises, turn them into other promises very easily through a set of nice little methods. Um, and there's, there's before, besides just get, there's, you know, there's put, there's post, there's invoke for methods, so on and so forth. You can see those in the, in the documentation. But the point is anything you can do in synchronous code, you can do with these promises in an eventual sense. So, so let's go back to those problems, right? Remember where if you tried to do things in sequence with callbacks, it looked like this, and it was ugly and nested. And you know, we had to keep these, these closures passing around, and we had to pass this state into there, and this state into there. Well, with promises, it's all like this. You just say, I'm going to get a promise for the user clicking, and then I'm going to take the result of that and pass it to the prompt user for Twitter handle thing. And I'm going to take the result of that and pass it to the get tweets for method. And I'm going to take the result of that and pass it to UI show. So we've reduced the, the pyramid of doom, as, as we call this, um, into a very nice sequential sequence of operations. All right, but parallel join, right? This was the one that really bugged us, that we were like, we hate writing this code. You know, this code is no fun to write and it's no fun to read because you don't know what's really going on. Well, here's how promises solve it. You say, get me three promises, one for Twitter, one for Stack Overflow, one for Foursquare. Then turn them into a promise for an array, okay? So this q.all function turns three promises in an array into an array of results. And so then we have the, the tweets in results zero, the stack overflow in results one, the Foursquare in results two. Um, and the reason that we have to use this array syntax instead of a callback taking three arguments is because remember, we're trying to parallel synchronous code. We're trying to have one return value, one fulfillment va reason, or one fulfillment value. So we don't want to have this situation where we never know how many, call, how many arguments our callback gets. It's always one. But we can add a little bit of syntactic sugar with a function like spread. So spread says if you know you're going to get an array, 
then I'll turn it into this so you can rename them in your callback. So this is just even nicer, right? So we've got a really nice solution for this parallelism problem right here with promises. So I think that's a big win. Finally, there's this, this kind of minor problem, but it really comes in and hurts you if you, if you notice it or if, if you run into it. So let's say we had code like this with callbacks. So we go check the cache, and if the user is already in the cache, we call back immediately. Otherwise, we do an AJAX request. Well, the problem with this code is that the first time you call it, the user is not in the cache, so the code runs like this. It goes to console log one, and then we go to two, and then eventually the callback comes back. But the second time you run the code, it goes one, username, Dominic, two. So what happened here is because the second time it was in the cache, we called back immediately. It was actually synchronous, not asynchronous. So this is actually a real hazard because it makes it hard to reason about and think about how your program will work. Um, because you never know if your calls are going to be synchronous or asynchronous because you never know how somebody's coded their callback-based library. But if using promises, this is what the code looks like. You say if the cache is there, return a promise, an already resolved the promise for the cache value. Otherwise, return the promise for getting it with AJAX. But you're always getting a promise, and so every time it's always asynchronous. So this is a nice guarantee that if you use promise code, you always get asynchronicity. Um, and finally, this is the biggest win, I think, of promises, is exception style error bubbling. Right, so, so here's our callback-based code, and it doesn't have any error handling at all. But here's our callback-based code if we wanted to get those errors and pass them up the chain, right? You have to do this annoying pattern. If there's an error, well then, pass it to the error handler. Otherwise, go do your next callback. And if there's an error there, pass the error handler. Otherwise, go to your next callback. And this is the kind of stuff that you write over and over and over again when writing callback-based code, because there is no solution for error bubbling in the same way there is in synchronous code. In synchronous code, when we throw an exception, it bubbles up the chain until somebody's ready to catch it and handle it. But in asynchronous code, we just get the errors, and we don't know what to do. If, I mean, if we don't handle them, they go away forever, and you lose that state of your application. So here's how it looks like in promises. Right? Because we have this nice composable syntax, we can say, well, then we're going to get their best friend, we're going to do the first callback, but if it fails, we'll do the error callback. And then we're going to get, you're going to show it in the UI, but if that fails, we'll do an error callback. So that's really nice. But actually, it's even nicer than that, right? Because exceptions bubble, right? So we would never have to handle it until the last minute. Well, that's exactly how promises work, because you can in fact write the code like this. You can say, get the user, if that fails, well, then we'll immediately transition. We will skip the success step. We'll transition to the failed step of the next line, and it'll go to the error callback for the next line. So it's just like a try-catch. You don't have to try-catch every level of code. You only have to try-catch the uppermost level of code. So that's exactly what we're doing here, is the outermost level is where we're doing our error handler. Um, similarly, we get another, some more benefits, right? So let's say all we knew was what we'd seen so far was, so let's say we, we started a spinner in the UI to show the user there's progress going on. And then we get the user, and then we show their best friend, and then we stop the spinner on success. But if there's an error, we show the error, we also want to stop the progress spinner. Well, in, in exceptions, in synchronous code, we know exactly how to handle this. We have a finally statement. Whether the try or the catch succeeds, or whether, whether the success or the, the catch clause succeed happens, the finally always executes. Well, it's the same with promises. There's a fiend method where you can just say, finally, do this code, no matter whether the success or the error handler occurs. Um, so you get similar things where you can do things like retrying, given a, a temporary network error. Because the promises are composable and you can just return a promise from another function, you can say, OK, well, if the error happens, I'm going to return the promise um, in this case. But if it's another error, one we don't know how to handle, I'll just throw it, and somebody else will catch it higher up the chain. Um, and this is nice, because this is exactly a, a infinitely retrying function in the case of temporary network error, but with so little code. We didn't have to manage our callbacks. We didn't have to make sure the callbacks were only called once. We didn't have to create a stack to keep track of how many times we've been called. So that's, those are the benefits. Um, and that's, that's really the meat of my talk, so I hope you liked it. But just briefly, how do you start using promises? Well, the best library is uh, maintained by Chris Kowal and, and myself. It's called Q, um, just English letter Q. 
Um, it can consume promises from jQuery. So jQuery has a notion of promises. They're not very good. They break several standards. Um, they have problems that I would be happy to talk about at length. Um, but they're usable. And uh, more importantly, you can use them with Q. So Q gives you all the goodies that we've seen so far today. Um, and other libraries like WEN.js or actually Microsoft's WinJS with Windows 8 also implement this promises standard. Um, it's called CommonJS Promises A. Um, but Q is, is my favorite, and it's the library that I'm actively working on um, to this day. Um, so yeah, if you're already using jQuery's promises, switch to Q. We have a nice wiki page explaining why. Um, and this is my, my contribution. I, I don't know if you guys know this meme. Um, all right. <laughs> right. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes? All right. Well, we can either do questions or I can show you a little bit more about how to like, create your own promises. How are we feeling? All right, I don't see any burning questions here. Oh, what do you got? So now people have some questions? Yeah, okay. sure, All right, we can do that. The promise, the promise is in in your speech. It look, it, it, it looks like the the monad in Haskell. So, what's the relationship between them? Um, unfortunately, I I didn't take category theory in school, and I didn't learn Haskell, so I, I don't know the answer. I have heard people say that they are monads. Um, I don't know if it's true, but it's probably there's probably a very strong relation. Um, so. So, Nick, so can promises can be combined with Mr. Jaws, WinJS? Actually, yes. Um, that's a very interesting topic. So one library that does something very similar to, OK, so let's step back for a minute. Um, the basic idea behind, wi behind WinJS or other libraries like TaskJS um, is that they give you a method of pausing the event or of of asynchronously moving over the event loop while keeping your code looking synchronous. Promises are actually a perfect fit for this because promises are designed to exactly emulate synchronous code with the whole one return value, one fulfillment value, one rejection reason, one and throw an exception. They're, they're meant to work together perfectly. So one person has actually already prototyped this, not with WinJS, but with similar, pro similar things. So in Firefox, there's actually a feature called generators um, that allow you to do something very similar to WinJS's await. Um, oh, internet. Well, uh, yeah, this isn't going to work. Hey, what's this do? I don't know. Um, so I'm going to type the URL here. So yeah, it's not going to work. But if you go to uh, taskjs.org, you can see some really interesting code written. It only works in Firefox currently, but it will work in the next version of the language, in ECMAScript 6, that uses the yield keyword in the same way as WinJS's await keyword in combination with promises to give you a very nice WinJS style code. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Hello. Yeah, thank you for uh, the nice presentation. But actually, I like the promise. So my, I have two questions. One is you said it has uh, difference with jQuery. As far as I know, jQuery has kind of similar thing after uh, 1.7. So can you show a little bit detail about what's the difference? Another sure. one is, uh, do you uh, are we able to use this uh, Q library in Node.js? Because I know there's a, a, another library named uh, Promise. I think it's Promise or something. So it's just integrated with Node.js, but I am not feeling that uh, that one is very easy to use. So, yes. so this is my two questions, thank you. So yeah, so I'll, I'll address your last question first since it's easier. Um, you can definitely use Q in Node.js. Um, I use it there every day. We've written an entire application server with Q. Um, we, we put a lot of work into the Q readme, so it is hopefully very easy to use, unlike the other library you mentioned. Um, 
And uh, one, one nice anecdote, actually. Uh, so at NodeConf Summer Camp two weeks ago, I was there. Um, we had a discussion about domains, which are a new feature in Node 0 0.8, um, which are all about error handling and like how do you deal with these exceptions thrown in callbacks and so on. Um, what I realized after about an hour of discussing domains with everybody was that promises make domains entirely unnecessary. Um, if you use promises in application server, which, which we've actually done um, at, at my company, uh, the errors all bubble up to your original HTTP request and you don't need a domain to encapsulate it. So I thought that was just a cool, cool aside. Um, anyway, to answer your question about what's wrong with jQuery, um, so in 1.7 they, uh, they tried to conform to promises, promises A, the standard, but they really had trouble understanding the standard um, I had several heated discussions with them on, on mailing lists and bug trackers. Um, so the biggest issue is that they don't realize that thrown exceptions and rejections of a promise are supposed to be equivalent. So if you throw an exception and a promise callback in a, in a then in a, in a fulfillment handler or rejection handler, it will actually show up in your console. There's no way to catch it. There's no way to transform it into a rejected promise. So this is uh, really unfortunate and uh, destroys compatibility with Promises A. I've written uh, several libraries that are agnostic to your Promise implementation. You can use them with Q, you can use them with when.js, when you can use them with Win.js, Microsoft, but unfortunately you can't use them with jQuery because they've made this decision. Um, so you know, I, I tried discussing it with them, but they just they don't understand um, the importance of that equivalence um, from what I can see. There's also legacy concerns, right? So like the example of uh, how jQuery promises are often resolved with more than one value or rejected with more than one reason. I mean, that's not compatible with common JS promises A, um, but it's, you know, it's a legacy concern. There's nothing they can do about that because their XML HTTP request acts like that. Hope that helps. Okay. 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 So I do have a question. So when you're waiting, when you get the promise and then it actually, at some point you need the promise to be there, right, in your code, right? So is there an easy way to figure out if that is waiting or if it, if, if the, you know, like if the asynchronous operation has already, so you're trying right. to tune, let's say, hey, can you tell whether or not. Right, so like is there a way to pull the promise and say are you, are you fulfilled yet or are you rejected yet? Yeah, or also just when you're, let's say you got some production code and it's slower than you expected and you're trying to figure out if it's because you're actually waiting on a promise where you thought the I.O. was fast enough. Right? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so there is. There, there's utility methods, is fulfilled, is rejected, is resolved. Um, resolved is, is a superset of both fulfilled and rejected. Um, yeah, there is. Um, we've actually spent a lot of time on the debugging story in queue. We try and get long stack traces working, um, if you know what those are, so that when you do an asynchronous jump from one promise operation to another, it actually keeps the stack trace, um, unlike callbacks. So that's really fun. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dominic. Okay. Yeah.